welcome to the Woolly Mama Fiber Company podcast episode two. My name's Emma and I'm coming to you from um, the north coast of Northern Ireland um, from a small farming town called Balamani and um, I am the dyer and maker behind Woolly Mama Fiber Company. Just me on my own. Um, so yeah, so thank you all for your lovely response to my first episode. Um, it was quite nerve wracking putting it out there, but um, you're all very kind to me, so that that helped. <laughs> so decided to record episode two, so it was okay. So yeah, so um, a few people were saying that I didn't really just like about me or where I was from in the last episode. So as I said before, Balamani is like a small farm in town um, and probably a medium sized town. I live kind of kind of close to the middle but also close to the country. So um, and but I grew up partly on a farm. It was a dairy farm and yeah, I've always kind of been involved with things going on in the countryside and that type of thing. So um, that farm wasn't in Balamani, it was a bit down the road and then I moved here. Um, but yeah, so that's where I'm from. Um, what else could I tell you about Balamani? Nothing very exciting happens here, it's just like a small town. Um, yeah. I think that's all I can really say about Balamani. <laughs> People call it cow town because it's like a farmer town, like a, a farmer's town. Um, so that's its nickname around here. So yeah, nothing else to say about Balamani. So I'll go on and tell you about my whips and my finished objects and some stuff that's coming in the shop and some stuff, some colours and my new Ravelry group, I'll have to talk about that. Very exciting. So the first finished object I have is, just let me get it, is my socks in all treats, no tricks. Have to always make sure I say that right. So this is one of the Halloween autumn specials. Um, it was supposed to be more like trick or treat like darker and more purple and and then it turned out really like sweet and nice so I was like oh it has to be um no tricks all treats <laughs> all treats no tricks and um, so yeah so it's just like a plain van vanilla sock I've been so like I've had quite a lot of things on so my knitting I haven't had much brain power to knit so I've just been using the same recipe that I normally use. So I cast on 64 stitches, which seems like quite a lot on 2.5 millimeter needles. And I'm starting to think now they're a little bit big perhaps. And I think they would possibly wear better if they were a little tighter. So um, yeah. Because this was my first pair, they're actually on me. This was with an oak colourway, a one of a kind. I think it was a oak one maybe. Um, but I like it quite a lot so I might make a proper thing. So I've been basically wearing these really really hard and I think they're slightly too big for me which doesn't really help the wearing of them. But they have been doing quite well. Basically I'm really hard in socks and I don't show them any mercy. <laughs> So, yeah, so I've been wearing them in the studio every day, in the garden, out on walks, literally like every day, pretty much. Um, and the warmth from them is unbelievable compared to other socks that I have. Um, so I really like them. They have very slightly felted around the toe and the heel but um, I had this book that I was reading a while back it's called The Old Hand Knitters of the Deal um, I'll insert a little picture of it here I can't remember the author's name I think it means something possibly oh no maybe not um, 
and they actually knitted the socks a few sizes too big and stockings as well and then felted them I guess so uh, they would wear better and B they'd be warmer um, so I don't know maybe that's something I'll try I'll knit like a couple of sizes too big and then felt them and see see what happens might be interesting um, but so far there's absolutely no sign of holes which is great and there shouldn't be holes because I've only had them like a couple of months um, so I'm expecting these to last pretty well um, yeah so in the Ravelry group maybe I'm going off on a slightly on a, in a ta on a tangent here but in the Ravelry group I started a thread called no nylon sock experiments so anyone that's tried no nylon socks can give tips on how best to knit socks and to care for them um socks without nylon that is um to make them last as long as possible so there's probably loads of designers there's probably loads of designers and people out there who'd be it'd be cool if they would want to contribute um because there's probably techniques that i don't know that you can use to reinforce areas or things like that that i'm not that sure about but yeah there's probably ways that you can knit socks that's better than just a regular way a regular way that you would knit socks so yeah so that's in my Ravelry group. There's a link in my link tree in my bio on Instagram. So if you want to join the group, you can join it there and add your thoughts about what you think of all of this. But I think next time I'm going to knit socks, I'm going to cast on maybe like 50, yeah, I don't know. What do you cast on? Or maybe I should go down a needle size to see. I wonder if that would help the wear also. And I'm just, I just do like a, I always do this type of heel. It's a heel flap and gusset. But I was wondering if it was basically possible, you know, you slip the stitches, it's like slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one. And then on the other side, it's a uh, slip one and then purl to the end. I wonder if it's possible. I think it is, I've done this before to slip on both sides, but on, you know, the opposite stitches. So you're still, knitting obviously and I wonder if that would reinforce the heel any don't know it's just an idea and then the toes I don't know what you'd really do to reinforce them haven't had any ideas for that so if you have ideas do let me know I'd be interested to hear but yeah so no brain power vanilla socks the month of October there was loads of orders so thank you everyone but I was really busy packing and dying and packing and dying and packing and dying. <laughs> um, so yeah, brain power was like, ooh, silch. So that's that. Um, my next, actually, I think those are my only FOs. Onto whips. So the last time I showed you, last time I was doing a podcast, I was just about to start Andrea Myrie's Weekender sweater pattern in newest wool seeth. Hope I say that right. Newest wool, you can keep me right. And I was like, oh, tubular cast on her freaking out a little bit. But anyway, turned out it was easy and it was fine. And once I got the cast on done, I really, really enjoyed knitting this. So I'm now, I have knit up to here. So I just need to do the three needle bind off and the sleeves. Looks right. So I just got ran out of storage space on my phone. So here we go again. So this is my weekender sweater in newest wool, seeth. And I'm just about to do the sleeves. So um, there's a well, I was going to say there's a nice bit of positive ease. I think there is, but um, haven't. I may have tried it on. I'm not sure. But this is going to be really nice to wear for Christmas. So, and I'm excited to get started on the sleeves. 
Um, I know people have this thing about like not liking knitting sleeves, but I like it. I think it's kind of fun because you're kind of like, oh, almost finished the, you're almost finished the project and you can almost wear it. So I kind of like the sleeves, they're fun. And everyone will be going, oh. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, my next whip is, um, so last time I did a podcast, I think I showed you my Scooger shawl by Melody Hoffman. And I haven't made any progress on that. So I'll maybe pick it up again sometime, but I've started another shawl by Melody something I thought maybe that it would be a little easier, possibly. Um, but challenging enough to kind of use my brain a little bit. So this is the plume shawl. It doesn't look like much at the minute, but I'm really pleased with it. It does look like a funny shape, but it's not. It's just because it's not blocked or anything. So you can see the nice, um, it's nice lace work and garter stitch sections. And then here, there's a lateral braid, sec, little lateral braid row, which I've never done before until last night. So I just looked up the tutorial and um, it was easy, it was fine. And it was quite nice. And yeah, so you've the nice lace sections and then it's broken up by the garter stitch, stitch sections. So I'm really, really enjoying this. Um, so the yarn I'm using for this is my BFL Massim 4-ply. It's 400 meters per 100 grams. So when I swatched for this project, um, I didn't quite achieve gauge, but I was okay with it being a little bit bigger. Um, I think it was originally designed in a verb for keeping warms Evie, even tinier Annapurna. So that's like 500 meters maybe per 100 grams. So this is 400 meters. So it's gonna be a little bit bigger, but I did um, switch down needle sizes to, it's supposed to be a, I think 3.75, but I went down to 3.25. Um, so it's gonna be a little bit bigger, but that's okay. That'll be nice for the winter. So yeah, the yarn for this, as you can see, I've never actually dyed multicolored on the gray base and I was not really sure how it was gonna turn out or like what I'd think of it or I don't know, the gray bases always speak to me of being like solids, solid colors or semi-solid colors. But I was just like gonna try it and see if I like it. And I did, and I love it so much. So, yeah, you can see some of the different little specks of yellow and purple and pink, but it's not, it's still like really muted. So it's not like, it's not in your face at all. And from a distance, it just kind of looks vaguely purpley pink y kind of. So, I'm knitting this on my chow goose, which is nice. So I'll show you what it looks like in the skein. It doesn't look overly attractive in the skein, I don't feel. Maybe I'm not supposed to say that. But when it's caked up, it looks really nice. So, and it's knitting up so nicely. So I'm really pleased with that. So that might be something that I potentially could offer kits for, or maybe I'll just have, um, different coloured, different colours on grey bases more often. I don't know if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. So yeah, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, it's just, I kind of got to the stage there where I was knitting so many vanilla socks. Like I think I was nearly on my third pair that I was like, no more socks, please. So even though I love knitting socks. Um, so yeah, so there is that. And by the way, I'm not just knitting socks for the sake of knitting socks, <laughs> in case you think I am. I 
I'm trying to replace all the socks in my wardrobe that have holes in them that aren't knitted. So just ones that have been bought to me or I've bought in the shop. Um, I'm trying to replace them all with knitted socks. Um, well, they all end up in holes anyway, so but that's why I'm knitting so many socks and I'm trying gradually to replace them as they start to wear away. Um, I will be basically replacing them with some nice knitted socks. So um, that's a nice thing. Some of you have possibly seen in my Instagram stories about a new yarn that's coming to the shop or a few new yarns. The first one is a Tease Water blend. Oh, I can't remember what it's blended with. I'll put it below. That is from just a few miles away from where I live. The farmer, he's kind of a hobby farmer. He has another job, I think. Um, but he keeps these sheep anyway, and he wanted to do an experiment and get get his fleeces spun so the fleeces are currently at the natural fibre company and they are in line I think for being delivered to me sometime in the new year it was supposed to be before Christmas and then but now it's after Christmas um, so that'll be really nice to have a wool that is truly local to me that's kind of a dream of mine and really where I want Willy Mama Fibre Company to go to have its own limited edition ranges of really local wool um, so I'm excited about that I think it's coming January maybe February I'm not sure and then a little while ago um, I did a poll all my stories about iron art and iron weight and pff, loads of you said you'd really like an iron weight so I thought oh well yeah I should get that then shouldn't I <laughs> so I was searching around for some nice um iron weight pieces something a bit different something a bit more interesting maybe and I found some Shetland and I found some South Down so Iron Weight, Shetland and South Down are both coming to the shop. They should be here in a few weeks. I don't think I'll have them in time for the December update. But we'll we'll see. It'll probably be January, February when I le release those. Um also because um I should have said this at the start. I'm actually podcasting today because I'm having some electrical problems. <laughs> And I'm waiting for the electrician to come so I can't dye anything, which is rather a shame. But hopefully it'll be fixed soon. Um so yeah, that's why I'm podcasting today rather than actually dying. Otherwise Yes, yeah, so I haven't actually managed to dye anything yet for the next update, so it might be a bit of a panic. I'm not sure. <laughs> but hopefully he'll be able to come Monday at the latest to fix it for me. Anyway, totally off on a tangent there. I haven't got so sorry. Anyway, this is my the next thing I'm going to be casting on when the right needle size arrives. Well, it's sorry when then when the right size of cable arrives. Um, but this is a little swatch for another no frills sweater. This was knit using my BFL Gotland 4-ply so I'm not using a strand of mohair for this because I don't stock it in the shop because a while ago, I don't know if you heard um, about the whole scandal with mohair and basically the animals in South Africa were treated really badly and that's where most of mohair is from I just thought, no the BFL Gotland is actually a really good alternative. It's possibly even better than using the mohair lace because, well, it has a really, has a nice little halo, not too much, just, I don't know if you can kind of see, 
it's got nice yellow and I achieved gauge with the stated needle size which was a four and also this yarn is a uh, so the first one I knitted was a uh, with merino animal hair silk that was before I did much research into mohair um, so yeah so if you don't want to knit a no frill sweater if you want to knit it without the mohair silk then this is a really good alternative and I achieve gauge really easily so um, this is a good one so it's also a two ply yarn loads of people have had loads of questions about two ply three ply one ply yarns basically when i talk about that it's to do with the makeup of the yarn rather than how thick it is so for example loads of people sell singles which is single ply it's it it's not been plied with anything so i'll try and get an example here so my sock yarn is a two ply. So if you took one of these threads and untwisted it, I don't, I don't think you can see that, but if you untwisted it, there would be two strands making up this yarn. That means it's two ply. So all the spinners out there will know what I'm talking about. So in order to make this yarn, a two ply yarn, two bobbins have to be spun and then they're twisted the opposite way together to make a two ply yarn and generally why you do that is to create a balanced yarn and to create a stronger yarn for knitting with so that's what I mean when I say two ply three ply is the same thing but it's three strands twisted together it's nothing to do with the weight the how thick or thin the yarn is so I hope that makes sense so the BFL Gotland is a two ply yarn and that will be nice and probably a bit more robust than like using for example singles and a strand of mohair silk. So I'm going to try this, it's a bit of an experiment and see how it goes. So that's my last whip, well if you could call it a whip it's a swatch. <laughs> um, so what else do I have to tell you about? Yes, Christmas colours and also people were asking in my podcast Ravelry group about what books, what dyeing books that I use. So I'll show you the books first. So I have a small selection of dyeing books. Only actually two of them are mine. The rest of them I have borrowed from my local guild, which I'm a member of. Um, so they have a library where you can borrow books if you want to, you just have to be a member. So I'll show you some of the books that I use for that, in case you're interested. So here's one, Dying with Natural Dyes by Judy Palmer. Don't really use this one, but it's there if you're interested. Um, this one, Vegetable Dying by Alma Lish. Don't really use it very much either to be honest <laughs> here's another one um natural dyes for spinners and weavers it's by hetty wiggins again don't really use this one either should probably take them all back um this one is a kind of um a, a dyer's manual by jill goodwin it's more of a information book than a recipe book so I look at this if I have a question about a certain thing, but I don't use it loads. Um, this is the one that I use probably most. It has more like recipes, but some of them are um, a bit outdated because it's, it was published in probably in the 70s or 80s. And there's loads of recipes with like, oh yeah, 1974. There's loads of recipes in it, like this type of thing, about like lichens. Obviously, I don't use lichens really at all, ever. <laughs> but it has loads of quite interesting recipes. Uh, like even like more like recipes for mordants and 
about different plants and stuff but those of them are using like copper and tin and I don't use copper and tin I haven't yet really just because I feel like there's so many possibilities with even just using iron and like mixing colors and doing different glazes like one color on top of the other I just feel like there's so much potential with that already like I haven't exhausted the possibilities with that yet so I don't really want to add something else into the mix and plus they're not really I don't know but I can see why they're useful because there's some colors that's really hard to achieve um, without using these things although I feel like I get quite a good range of colors but I can see the advantage of using tin and copper and stuff because um, you only need such a small pot you only need such a small bit and you get it widens your variety of colors by like a huge percent um, but at the same time they're obviously like a lot more bad for the dyer to use them because if you breathe them in they're a lot more like toxic because alum is a type of salt basically and it's used in food preparation and stuff and it's not it's it's very safe to use but obviously you should always be wearing a mask no matter what dyeing you're doing although I do have a little problem with masks because when I put a mask on my glasses steam up but there's probably a something I can get with the whole face I'm not sure if any dyers are watching this please tell me where I can get a good mask um so yes this is the one that I probably refer to the most this is the last of the guild books um I'll show you what books I have myself I have um the modern natural diary those of you probably know this book it's the Woman who runs of her for keeping warm. This is her book. Um, it has uh some recipes in. Most of it when I got by the time I got the book, I knew how to do like pretty much most things in it. Bar her indigo recipes, kind of interesting because I can't. I there's one ingredient that I can't find, and when I inquired about it, I was told that it's quite dangerous and basically I will have a really hard time finding it anywhere and I think it's sodium hydrosulfite so yeah haven't used this recipe but there's that and it's very beautiful it's it's a lovely publication it's a really nice book hardback and everything really nice um, the other one I have is Botanical Colour at Your Fingertips by Rebecca Desnos. She has a lovely Instagram feed. Go and look at it. And her book is gorgeous. It's full of lovely photographs. And um, Rebecca uses a method of mordanting, mordanting using soy milk, which is interesting. Um, I don't use soy milk because... Obviously, it comes from like the other side of the world, um, and you need a lot of it to dye. Probably what I'm dying, and it's just uneconomical and just doesn't make sense for me to use it. So, um, it's probably. I don't know, alum's been used for like centuries basically and it works well and there used to be like alum factories in like England and stuff, I'm not sure if they still produce alum in England, um, I think, I think they probably do actually, um, but Rebecca um, doesn't use alum because she thinks the soy milk um, is more, produces better results. And probably if I was um, just dying, you know, just for 
well I do dye for fun but if I was just dyeing smaller bits of fabric I might try it just to see what the difference is and that type of thing but um, I think for me it's not it doesn't make any sense to use soy soy milk try and keep it as local as possible I guess in saying that though um, well obviously it's all well and good saying keep it local but loads of dyes come from all around the world because that's where they're grown but I think the problem with with this for me is that I would need so much of it that it doesn't make sense to do it um, so but lovely publication nice recipes loads of questions answered she talks a bit about iron water which is really nice and pattern making with iron water which I like which I do sometimes um trying to think what else so yeah I've talked quite a long time about dying and what's kind of what works for me and what doesn't work for me some of you were asking about the multicolored schemes that I've started doing like for this and this is just um, a method of bundle dyeing so you just basically set the skein down and put your you can put your extract or your um you can put your extract or whatever it is you your plants or your botanicals down and then you just roll up the skein tie it up and put it in the pot and then you just leave it there and simmer it for a little while so that's how I do the multicolored so yeah I do use quite a lot of extracts now the reason I use quite a lot of extracts is because it's much easier to make repeatable colors because you can it's more accurate like when you weigh an extract rather than weighing and not like a picked dye stuff because when you pick a dye stuff there's obviously a certain amount of water content in it so you'd have to always make sure you wet at the same time or you dry it out to the same degree every time um so i think for that as well it's yeah it's probably makes sense for the repeatable colorways but i still do like to experiment with plants from the garden um i recently did a garden club which was made with things from the garden which is really fun i'll not say what they are in case people haven't got them yet but that's still a passion of mine and it's just something if i had a month off dying for the shop what I would do is go around my local area and try out different things that I'd like to try dyeing with. So, um, yeah, so I still have, I would probably most of the stuff picked from the garden and dyed would be around autumn time is when I do that or the summer, it depends what I'm using. There obviously is a lot less stuff in winter you'd have to look a lot harder to find stuff it wouldn't just be maybe it wouldn't just be in your garden um but yeah i still do use stuff from the garden sometimes and i'll usually always say in the listing if i've used stuff from the garden or what plant it's from sometimes i say so yeah, so I use a mixture of extracts and stuff from the garden, stuff from the farm, that sort of thing. Um, I thought I'd take just a second to show you my new packaging, which I am totally in love with. Um, so I said I'd be changing over to paper mailers a while back, so I've managed to organise that and get them. So they have a little gusset, so perfect for putting wool in. The reason I am changing from my compostable um, poly mailers to these is because not everyone has a compost heap at home and not everyone has the facilities to, to you know, 
they don't have a garden to go and bury it. So um, that's why I'm changing because it's easier for people to reuse them. It's easier for people to recycle them. And yeah, that's why I'm changing basically because we don't want all of those compostable mailers going in the black bin because that kind of defeats the purpose of them a little bit. So yeah, and I have my stamp. You can see my stamp here. And at the moment I'm using uh, washi tape and a sticker, but those will be phased out in favor of brown printed paper tape which is coming in the next few weeks I hope so and um, the yarn is will be wrapped in newsprint and slipped inside this nice brown paper bag so I hope you like that and yeah um, new colours come to the shop oh yeah stuff comes to the shop nearly forgot to tell you all so the next update will see the launch of two patterns that have been designed in my yarn. One by Appella Knits, um, probably loads of you follow her on Instagram. So she designed a shawl called the Gizmo Shawl and that's in my BFL Masim 4 Bly Base. So that will be released on the 1st of December and I'll have probably a few little kits for that. The second um, pattern that is being released on the 1st of December is one by Sustainablist, which is Verena Coors. And she designed a beautiful colour work um, sweater in my Wensley Deal DK base. So some of you have probably seen the photos, but it's um, big snowflakes. And um, it's really gorgeous it's really nice so i'll i'll maybe put in a photo or something here if i can figure out how to do that so that's being released also um i did a little collaboration with hannah lisa haferkamp of hlh designs and i dyed up some fabric for her and she made some bags from it and um, so they will i will have some for sale and she will have some for sale uh, on the 1st of december and they're made of Irish linen and um, I got it from a factory near near where I live and I dyed it up here in my studio and so her bags are really lovely and yeah they'll be available in my shop and her shop. The other things that will be available is um, a few festive colourways so I had this one in the last update. This is Holly. So just really, it's quite fairly minimalist. It's quite just with a bit of red and green. So that's quite fun. I think that'd be a nice pair of like Christmas socks or maybe if you wanted to knit. I know someone's going to be knitting a stocking with this, which would be quite fun. And you get a few out of this, I think, or just one big one. I'm going to be having in the next update also some sock sets. So these are just some of the minis that I've made up for. I'm going to have some mini kits as well, like just a few with minis, different sizes of minis. And then I'm going to have a few sock kits as well because I didn't manage to make that many in the last update. So I thought, ah, oh, better make a few more and they'll be in more kind of colour toned. I'll do some bonfire and pumpkin, but I'll also do more colour tones, so maybe slightly more bluey, greens, greys, that sort of thing. And there'll be a few more winter kind of colourways that I'll make up, hopefully if my electric gets fixed and I get everything done that I want to. Um, that will be on the next update on, that's on the 1st of December at 8 p.m. because also most of you said you prefer if I moved the update to later in the evening rather than the middle of the day so that will hopefully help all of you US people all you lovely US people um, 
So, oh, and I have to tell you about the, the knitting retreat as well. So many things to say. So I'm organising a knitting retreat with Kate from Hawthorne Cottage Craft. Um, she has a lovely podcast, so you should all go and watch it. And we are, our retreat is going to be from the 1st to the 3rd of December, and it's going to be um, in Northern Ireland um, from the 1st to the 3rd of December. And our special guest, who is coming all the way from the Hudson Valley, is Aidan the Knitting Monk. So he is going to be running the weekend for us. And um, he is going to be all about contemplative making, intentional making, making with a purpose. And he's going to run all our sessions thinking about these themes. Um, and yeah, we're going to have um, the place, the, the accommodation is a retreat centre, which is in Lorne. And Lorne isn't probably known for being the nicest place, but this this retreat centre is beautiful. It's like an old building and it's called Drum Alice. So you can look that up if you want, Drum Alice. And it looks out over the sea and it's kind of up above the town and it's just really calm and lovely and it's got a big garden. And yeah, if it's a nice day, you could sit out and look over the sea and knit. So, that is happening next year and tickets for that will go live on the 1st of February and yeah if you have any questions about that or anything do put it in the comments because I'm probably not telling you everything that I am probably forgetting stuff Um. so yeah, we're so excited about that. We don't think there's any other knitting retreats in Northern Ireland like that. Um, and hopefully, there's only 17 spaces. I forgot to say that. So, if you're thinking about coming, we would love to have you. And it's going to be a really relaxing weekend. It's not going to be like loads of stuff like loads of stuff to do it's just going to be really nice like kind of calm sessions and interesting thoughts and um interesting conversations hopefully too so yeah so i'll put all that down below um hopefully i don't forget to put any of the sh all of the links and stuff below i'm not very good at that yet <laughs> but i think that's pretty much everything for today and I hope um, the the dark evenings aren't too aren't too bad, and that you can all get the fire on, and enjoy some knitting and lots of cups of tea and nice dinners and all of that stuff. So I'll just uh, I'll say bye bye for now until the next time. Mm -hmm.